This is a West Volusia Historical Society interview at the African American Museum of Arts in Deland, Florida. And our interviewee today is Mary Allen, who's the executive director of the museum. My name is Mary Lou Peffer, and we are here, Mary, to welcome you to the West Volusia Historical Society Oral History Project. And thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview with us today. You are welcome. Thank you so much for asking me to be part of this interview. Well, I think this interview is long overdue because mm -hmm. this museum and you have been here for a long time, but uh, better late than never, and I'm really excited to, uh, to have your story to share with the, uh, with, the, with the community. And as you know, this will be on a YouTube channel, yes. so people all over the world will be able to watch and listen to this interview today. So oh. thank you again. Mm -hmm. I'd like to start, Mary, with some questions to get a little bit of your background mm -hmm. information. So would you just sort of tell us where you were born and raised in, uh, in your early days and perhaps where you uh, grew up mm -hmm. before you became an adult? Okay, I was born in Brundage, Alabama, and at the age of seven, we moved to Caseby, New Jersey. And um, do you come from a large family, Mary? Well, I, I would say so. It was three girls, two boys, uh, with my mother, and my father was deceased, but with my mother, uh, my grandmother, my two uncles, and my great-grandfather lived all together. You all lived together? Yes, Oh, yes. that must one have been big, an interesting... It was wonderful because we all, everybody was there. It was a big house. We all were there and we just had, that was the family. Yeah. Sounds interesting. Yeah. So you moved to Keysby, New Jersey at the age of seven, you mm -hmm. said, and where is that located? Keysby, New Jersey is located near uh, Middlesex County. It's a very small, quaint little place, about 2,000, maybe less than that at the time, and it was a non-incorporated little town. Um, very quiet, small, you know, community. We moved there uh, when I was age seven. I attended school there. What's the city nearest uh, that little town? Uh, Prethamboy. Oh, Prethamboy. Prethamboy, yeah. New Jersey. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty well-known city. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Fords. Fords and Prethamboy. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. But All right. Prethamboy is, is um, the closest. And now you're married. Yes, I and am married. How many years have you been married, approximately? About 41 About years. About 41 years. Mm -hmm. And you have children and grandchildren? Three, yes, three, three children, and I have a grandson. A grandson. Yes. They're always nice to have, aren't they? Yeah, they're, they he's are. a great kid. Um, Mary, you left the South yes. at a very young age, and I don't know if you can recall much of your background mm -hmm. at that time because you were such a little girl, mm -hmm. but what was the reason that your family all uh, picked up and moved to the Northeast? Well, my mother uh, was, uh, didn't, was concerned about her children growing up in, in a segregated South. She wanted to be able to provide a better education for her kids and more of uh, uh, where there was not so much you know, of the segregation where her kids could go to school mm -hmm. and not have to be harassed you know, with, with certain name calling and things of that nature. And she wanted a better life. Basically, she wanted a better life for her kids. Commendable. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as you were growing up in the, what, the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. pre uh, predominantly, uh, did your family discuss racial issues at home? Because you said that was the reason pr primarily that you moved away from the South. Yeah. Not at all. Really? You know, we grew up. Um, it never came up. You know, oh, really? I had brothers and sisters, you know, and we played together. We had fun. You know, it was just we never felt anything, you know, within the family. It was always... My mom, she loved to hug her kids. You know, she was just that type of mother. And we just had a good time, so we, they didn't discuss it. Whatever they told us to do, they might have known what the situation was, mm -hmm. but they didn't explain it to us as children. So whatever they told us to do, we did. If she says, well, you, if don't do this, you don't do that. We did, as what, we did what we were told, because that's how it was. Yeah. Right. Mom speaks that you do what they yeah. say. Yeah. Especially in the 50s and yes, 60s. Yes, you do what they say, absolutely. You, Mom is in charge. Did yeah. you ever um, like have other neighborhood involvements or community involvements like in the church or in the choir? Well, or yes, like we did because that was part of our uh, that was part of our family makeup. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were a kid, you're going to go to church. You're going to sing in the choir. You're going to participate in the yearly, you know, Christmas programs and things of that nature. That is exactly how we were raised. You go to church and you get involved. 
and as kids we did. We did it all. Yeah. So you felt like you had a pretty normal childhood then. Yeah, yeah. I did. I did. I enjoyed it. I had fun, really, you know. Yeah. Um, I had an outdoor little garden, you know. My grandmother helped, taught me how to, you know, and do embroidery with the needle and oh. things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And I had a little garden, you know. So it was fun. You know, I didn't feel any, I wasn't threatened in any way. You know, with my family surrounding, I was just growing up as a kid. And I had enjoyed my, my brothers and sisters. Um, when you moved up to New Jersey, were you um, startled or amazed or uh, uh, totally unaware <laughs> of the differences between Alabama and New Jersey? I know you were a little girl, but I was just wondering yeah. if, uh, as you were growing up, if you yeah. reflected well, on it. Well, the difference was, uh, and when I was growing up, that my brother and I were the as we said, we were only, me personally, I was one out of three black students in that school. Oh. So it was like, okay, it was different. Um, I knew that it was something that I would have to get used to, to be honest with you, because mm -hmm. it was a small school and it wasn't that many students and there was no one else who looked like me but the couple other students that was there. So that was a change. It was a, a big change for me. But um, uh, I dealt with it at for that age. I, I, I was there and I went and I did studied and did what I had to do. Uh, you know, there was some incidents uh, where the N word was used, um, but my mother took care of that quickly mm -hmm. because. Um, that's one reason she wanted to get her kids better, away from that kind of atmosphere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so um, that's how that was, you know, during that time. Well, that's interesting that you did not feel um, it, a severe discrimination then. No, and the, you as had I good said, teachers. And the teachers, the teachers was they they were nice. Um, you know, they didn't they didn't make me feel different, you know, even though, you know, I was the, one of the African-American children mm -hmm. in that school. Mm -hmm. They were fairly nice, you know, to me. Uh, like I said, there was some calling of this with the N-word, yeah, of course, yeah, I got cool. some of that. But the teachers never really showed any type of difference, you know, at that time with me. It could have been, but at my age, you know, was I able to pick it up? Perhaps I was, did not, you know, some, but I, I, I was okay at that. I was okay. Be, keep in mind that I still had my brothers and sisters at home. Sure. You know, so I, when I go home, whatever went on, I knew we was going to have fun. We were going to be laughing and joking, doing crazy stuff. Yeah. You know, and so I guess that's how I got through it, you know. Even when you were in high school, you didn't have that many uh, problems. Not that. in high school because it was a mixed school. In Perth Amboy, it was a mixed school, mm -hmm. you know, in Perth Amboy. So, and there were more African-American students in the school at that time when I was going to high school, which um, was um, okay. Okay, good. Yes. And then the, you went to college after I high school. I did, yes. I went to Jersey City State College, and that's where, as I said before, my parents never told us too much of anything. Uh, but when I went to college, it was another world. Really? Oh my gosh, I became involved with the Black Students Union there, and my whole world opened up about my culture, mm -hmm. my history, uh, and it just like blew me away because I had never been and heard it. I've never had been involved with it. And so then that's when I began to say, okay, there's more to this story that has been told. <laughs> and I was ready to dive right into it. Right into and the middle of it. Yes. Um, Tell me a little bit about something we discussed the other day when we were doing a pre-interview for this uh, interview today, that not only did you learn about the, more about your history and black culture, but um, you said something about even there in that yes. college, there was a little bit of racism, but yeah. it was... In the college itself, um, there was some, um, but at that time, I think you had a little bit more uh, there was a little bit more recognition of, of some of the contributions 
you know, of African Americans mm -hmm. during that time. And several of the professors were African American. My art, oh. art teacher, mm -hmm. he was African American. My history teacher was African American. So I, 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 that's where I got a wealth of my knowledge from, you know, from some of the teachers that was in college you're referring to. Are you referring to college or, yeah? Yes, uh -huh. mm -hmm. particularly, yeah. yeah. My college years, so that's why I, my, you know, I just became so involved and I wanted to know more and more. And so I just became totally in, in, involved, totally wrapped up. I was interested in learning about um, your involvement with the uh, National Black Theater of Harlem. Tell us a little bit about how that came about. Okay, and, that theater came about because <clears throat> several of my friends had uh, went, one of them, had, two of them had went to Howard University and I decided to go down one semester doing some special holiday that they were doing. And that's when I came across, when I saw a production done by the um, National Black Theater of Harlem. And when I saw that, I said, wow, I want to get involved in that. So I immediately found out where they were. And at the time I had my own vehicle, I had a car. Mm -hmm. I made my way to New York. <laughs> and I got involved with them. And that involved doing African dance, doing going out through the community, talking to people about the self-improvement, you know, how to pull yourself up and, and get more involved with the community. And I got involved with that. And we went to, we did pre, uh, events and things at Carnegie Hall. We went to, we took trips to Bermuda carrying this, this particular concept called the ritual that we were involved in. And uh, self-improvement, how to make life better for yourself and your community. So I really got involved with that through the acting and through the dancing and um, traveling with them as well. And then that led you to more traveling. Pardon me? That led you to more traveling. Oh, that did lead me to more travel. When I was in college, as I said, my art teacher uh, was, had assigned an assignment to me to go to Brooklyn, New York to look at the Senegalese Ballet. And that was when I uh, decided I need to go to Senegal, West Africa. So that's where I went. As a matter of fact, I went by myself. So. Um, and I learned and I traveled with them. I danced, I ate the foods, I went to the slave castles. I did everything possible in my time there because that was just another uh, identity for me, you know, mm -hmm. of who I was sure. and my culture. And so I mm -hmm. just did everything they said, do. I did it, I enjoyed it, I ate the foods, I pounded the food, I did it all. Because that was me, that was where I didn't know, but I found out where my roots were. And I saw people look just like me. The only difference was when I talked, they knew that I was not one of them because of my language. Sure. But other than that, it was they saw me as one of them. Mm -hmm. That had to be quite an awakening for it you. It really was, because the only way they knew any difference, I opened my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and I spoke English, and they knew that. And, um, but they accepted, you know, they accepted me as, as actually as one of them, you know. Um, I stayed with the family when I was there. And so wherever they went, they took me. And I'm with the dance company, wherever they went. She was, a, one of the youngest was Fanta. She, wherever they went, I went, so. Was that your only trip to West Africa? Or no, I went back to Ghana, Africa. Oh. And I stayed in Ghana one month. And again, I stayed with the family uh, there because I had met uh, their daughter in the theater group in New York. I had met the daughter, she was there visiting. And so she was gonna go back home. And I said, well, when you go back to visit, I will, I'm gonna come to visit you at your home. And so we did exchange information. And so that's what happened. I went back to visit and I stayed with her family there. Mm -hmm. And it was a great experience there yeah. because Again, I traveled to the uh, Cape Coast, where they had the slave uh, castle at the Cape Coast, Coast. So I traveled there as well. And then I just had another part of my history uh, put together, you know. So through that experience, I, um, I was pretty well on my way, you know, to 
just keep on evolving, keep on learning, and keep, going, keep on getting involved. And that's what I did. By that time, I was well involved with community, different community activities, and, um, and I just kept building on mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And then you went on to get a master's degree? I did. I have, a, yes, I did. I have a BA in elementary education. Uh, and then I got a master's in education as well. I'm uh, working at basically in the urban communities, mm -hmm. the cities, working in the cities, in the neighborhoods who, had a, who were challenged. I worked in neighborhoods that were challenged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's where I stayed until we all we decided to relocate in uh, Florida. But that's where a lot of my uh, training came from. I, it was a, and again, it was uh, a community that needed some, uh, I guess, improvement in life, you know, in the, in the style of life. The children needed, you know, some more, uh, more um, self-esteem building. Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. it was one of those communities where, you know, the, the living conditions were not the best. Mm -hmm. So that was perfect for me because I wanted them to be proud of who they were. Sure. So uh, <clears throat> one of my things was to teach them and tell them about who they were through, through history. It was predominantly African-American, Cuban, and Hispanic-American community that I worked. Mm -hmm. So that way I had an uh, opportunity to share my culture with them as they shared their culture, you know, with, with, the, with the school and the community because there was always involvement, you know, during certain holidays, events. So I learned about other cultures and learned to appreciate other cultures mm -hmm. and wanted them to appreciate my culture as well. So that's how I just got so wound up, yeah. you know, and everything that's centered around, you know, the, uh, the community that I lived in at that time. And then, and then after uh, getting married and starting your family, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> your husband convinced you that uh, it was too cold to stay in New Jersey, and he, you decided to move to Deltona, Florida. Yes, <laughs> he was tired of, of, of working <clears throat> in the cold, and he said, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Uh, and that's where we came, you know. Uh, we knew someone had, uh, that had moved here, uh, and we decided to come and visit. And we fell in love with Deltona. And we, that's where we said, okay, let's go. And we got here, and we'd been here. We moved here in 1989 89. to Deltona <clears throat> in 1989. And then you started your teaching again. In Seminole County. Seminole, yes. okay. Mm -hmm. In Seminole County. And um, I enjoyed it um, in that community again. It was a community that I could identify with in a community I knew that I could help. I could be of assistance, I could help. Because that was where, you know, coming through my previous, you know, experiences, right. mm -hmm. that that was be a place that I would enjoy. And it was a mix, it was a, it was a mix, you know, faculty, you know, mm -hmm. um, and everyone worked together. And we had, it was a great, great experience uh, there. Um, I also, at that time, I became Teacher of the Year hmm. at um, the, uh, at Midway, I'm sorry, at Midway Elementary School in 1994 and 1995. I became the Teacher of the Year. Congratulations but, on that. Thank you for that school. Mm -hmm. And then, did you retire from Midway, or did you <coughs> stay to go to another no, school? No, during that time, I we would I was transferred to a different school because they wanted to balance off the racial, you know, of, of teachers at each school. So mm -hmm. I was transferred to Longwood Elementary School, which was actually a predominantly white school. I think I was the second black teacher in that school. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, it was different. You know, it was different, um, but it was uh, an experience, again, that I enjoyed because I could take what I knew and I could share it and I became involved in other activities of the school. So uh, I actually ended up retiring from, uh, from Longwood, Longwood Elementary School in 2008. Well, I know that education wasn't your only passion mm -hmm. <clears throat> because you've been involved in a number of uh, community uh, mm -hmm. activities and uh, I think you said you uh, 
really enjoyed being one of the early members of the National Council of Negro Women in uh, mm -hmm. Daltona. Could you tell us a little bit more about yes. how that came about? Uh, when I moved there, uh, there, were very, there were very few activities or organizations that, you know, uh, were available. So a group of us got together, a group of women from Deltona got together, uh, and, and Mrs. Johnson was one of those individuals. We all got together and we said, uh, one of the members said, why don't we start a national chapter of the National Council of Negro Women? And that's what we did. We got together and we formed the West Volusia chapter of the National Council of Negro Women. And that is when I had the opportunity to meet Irene Dixon Johnson. She was our very first president of that organization. And I got involved with that organization as well. And then, as I said before, my experiences in New Jersey took me to different uh, organizations and different involvement. Uh, I presented to the Deltona community the concept of Kwanzaa, which is the African-American holiday uh, for African-Americans. And I presented that for the first time in the community of Deltona in 1992, after my involvement with the National Council of Negro Women. That was part of something that I uh, experienced in New Jersey, and I brought that experience with me down here to Deltona, and as well as doing it as a program, a yearly program, for the African American Museum of the Arts. Tell us a little bit more about what Kwanzaa is and what it means, what it meant to you, or what it means to you. Well, Kwanzaa is a holiday that was, that was founded by Milana Karenge, a professor out of the University of Southern California. He realized that there was not a holiday, actually, that represented our culture and our values in this country. So he came up with the Kwanzaa concept. And I won't go into all the details, but it's based on seven principles. And those are the seven principles, the Nguzu Saba, that the Kwanzaa is based on. And each principle has a particular meaning every day. It's for seven days. So that was the principle that, uh, that came, evolved, just from evolving from the, uh, the National Council of Negro Women to my involvement here. But that holiday is something that we continue to do today here at the museum in the month of December. In December. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it goes on for a week or for there's a whole month days, or what? For just, just seven Just the days. seven days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a lady from Bethune-Cookman College that I think you told me uh, actually started the National Council on Black Women. And um, she's a very famous person, has recently been honored in the in, the, in the Washington, D.C. Her name was Mary McLeod Bethune. Oh, yes. Tell us a little bit about how she influenced your life. What amazed me about her, and she had the perseverance, and she, had the, she saw the need, and she uh, didn't let anything turn her around. You know, she pursued. And what got me was that she, she was so convicted in what her beliefs were, and she saw the need of the education of African-American children. Her school predominantly was the normal school for African-American girls. Mm -hmm. And she didn't let anything deter her because she uh, started the school with one dollar yeah. and fifty cents. She stood on the corners and she sold sweet potato pies. People took money at her to help her, you know, for her vision. And it didn't turn her around. And so that was just, that was just that was, uh, that was a building block for me, you know. Don't let anyone turn you around. If you have a vision, you have a goal. Mm -hmm. You do all you can to maintain that goal, to see that goal come to fruition. Well, your involvement with your organizations in Deltona, your teaching career, uh, your travels, all the experiences you had with the dance and the mm -hmm. uh, other, um, mostly African-American cultures that mm -hmm. you became awakened to when you yes. were a young woman and you, that really caught your attention and yes. you've pretty much devoted your life to uh, assisting children and, and helping adults learn more about their yes. own culture and mm -hmm. to how to be proud of what they do and who they mm -hmm. are. And I think and, that came uh, to, as I said earlier, that I grew up not knowing, mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, once I, because once I knew there had to be more than what I was told. Mm -hmm. 
you know, uh, they didn't talk about it. They just did. They knew what my mom knew. My children will not be raised here. And so that was it. And so, as I as we had talked earlier, so once I really got involved with you know my culture, uh, those who had made contributions, you know, Mayor McLeod Bethune, uh, other you know great African Americans, I knew that that was what I needed to help devote myself to. Uh, not just my own culture, but other cultures know, you know, uh, our contributions and what we contributed to this country as a whole. So Mayor McLeod Bethune was very, uh, she influenced me a lot because of her stamina. She, she continued her struggle, her, 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 her desire to see better, a better life. Mm -hmm. And so that influenced me a lot. As, and, uh, as you said, I got involved, you know, with other organizations uh, uh, centered around, you know, self-improvement and things of that nature. And it just continued from one era, you know, from one thing to another. Right. And it was just, I considered those to be building blocks because, you know, in life, different things, you, you experience different things in life. But you wonder, well, why was this and why was that? But as you look at, as your life begins, even with family, you know, you make sure your family members, you make sure your children, okay, you understand who you are. You understand that you need to know the contribution. And then as your life begins to evolve, then I, for me, I guess I can say, I saw the puzzle come together through my different travels and things that I did. I began to see why, okay, hmm. Okay, and that's how we can, uh, okay. <laughs> and so after I got involved, and we'll go into that shortly, uh, I said, that's why. You know, all this experience was pre pre uh, preparing me for something else, that my goal, I had not reached the goal right. that I was to get oh, no, involved. That was my, I guess my, um, what can I say? That was what I was, not say born to do, but that was for me, you know, <laughs> that was for me. So um, that's how I see that. I don't regret it at all, uh, you know, doing what I've done, uh, you know, helping to educate, not just African American, but other, everybody, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I think each culture is of vital importance. I think each, every child should know who they are, where they came from. So that helps them to build their self-esteem and want to go forward and make better decisions in life. And all those uh, building blocks and experiences yes. led you to where we are today doing this interview. And that's such a fascinating story. I want you to tell us how it got started yes. before you came along and then how you've been yes. able to yes. uh, help maintain yes. it throughout the years. Yes, I became involved through Mrs. Johnson in 1999. Tell us who Mrs. Johnson is. Mrs. Johnson, and along with her husband, Maxwell Johnson, they are the founders, they were the founders I see. of the African American Museum of the Arts. And they had a vision, their vision was to, to, uh, to, uh, to establish a stable institution such as the African American Museum of the Arts in the African American community. They were one of the places where young African Americans and others could come and learn about the history and the contributions of African American people. And she wanted the young people to be able to come into this facility and, and begin to develop more self-pride in themselves and to help build their self-esteem. That was one of her concerns because she was concerned about the young people, making them feel better, feeling good at, about who they were. And so that was just one of her, her goals and concerns uh, for, uh, at the museum. So I became involved actually as a volunteer. Um, I came a couple of times over here one, after the museum was founded in 1994. I came here uh, to several her events, and Mrs. Johnson was the type of individual that she didn't have to know you 
well enough, but if she saw you and she, if she knew you, well, not, I say not well enough, but if she had seen you come several times, she would say, oh, I need someone. Can you go sit at that table for me? I need someone to sell T-shirts. And you would say, okay. <laughs> and you would go there and you'll sell the T-shirts and she'll tell you exactly how to take a tally and give your money, everything. Mm -hmm. And so I started out doing that. Uh, and it was, it was, well, it was good for me because I had experience being in that theater group in New York and I was, I was yearning for something like that to get involved in again. Right. So when I heard about the African American movement, of the arts, Museum of the Arts, it didn't take me long to find it. <laughs> and that's how we ended up here. So getting involved with her as a volunteer. And then she had asked me to, to uh, be an assistant with another young lady, her name was Pat, to be her assistant. And I said, okay, sure. And so I became her assistant. We worked together that year to do the Emoja Festival, okay, which was one of the Kwanzaa concepts, the Emoja Festival. So I got involved with Pat, and we had a great festival there, and I learned, you know, uh, how watching her, you know, what she went, did, and I followed suit. So Ms. Johnson uh, asked, uh, said to me, um, would you like to be our program director? Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, you know, and I did. I said, okay. So the next year, when we had the Mojo Festival, she gave me the title of of the program director in 2001. She gave me, she said, I want you to be our program director. And I said, okay. And that wasn't hard for me in a certain, for a certain point because when I was involved in my teaching in New Jersey, I was the coordinator of the programs there. So I had some background in a school setting, you know, as the historical programs at the school. Uh, I was over that, so. Mm -hmm. It kind of just like kicked in. And so that's how I really got involved as the program director. I did all the festivals, I did all the programming, uh, I did the summer camp, uh, you know, I did the art shows, you know, the art. So I got involved with Mrs. Johnson doing that. And as time went on, she decided that she wanted to retire. And she uh, just said, you know, uh, the amphitheater had been built, you know, through her efforts, her and Reverend Maxwell, and of course the community and the city efforts. What is the name of that amphitheater? It's, uh, in 2004, it was named in honor of Dr. Noble Thinman Watts. Okay. And that was her vision. She wanted to name that amphitheater in a well known African American in the community. Again, having that name there gave the community some more identity. Mm -hmm. Noble Thinman Watts. Many people from the community knew him because he grew up here. Mm -hmm. So therefore she wanted to give him that recognition as well as uh, he got an award from Stetson University, an honorary doctor award mm -hmm. from Stetson University. That's why it says Dr. Oh, okay. Noble Thinman Watts Amphitheater. Uh, he was quite a force in this community yes, for a he long was. time. Yes, he was. And very well known mm -hmm. and went off to make a well-known name for himself. And then he came back yes. to his community, mm -hmm. which is honorable. You know, he came back mm -hmm. to his com uh, community. And so that's basically how I got involved. And then, as I was saying not a few minutes ago, uh, she decided that she wanted to retire. And, of course, there was, you know, she there was a couple of other uh, opportunities, but they did not pan out, you know, as she had thought they would. Mm -hmm. So she had just said, well, I, 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 she didn't know at the point to what she really wanted to do. Uh, I had not made up my mind to retire at that time. Um, and she just called me one night on the phone and we were talking and she was saying, you know, she said, well, I, I just, you know, don't know what I'm going to do. And so I kept on talking, and we kept on talking. I said, okay, 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 Mrs. Johnson, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and that's how I got here. I said, I'll do it. And that was what year? 2008. And here you are today. And here I am today. <laughs> so that's how it all came. She needed, she wanted someone. And you know, be honest with you, I said it, <laughs> and I never looked back. I didn't. Yeah. 
I just said, okay, this is what I'm going, this is what I, I, she asked me to do. I knew her vision mm -hmm. and I said, this is what I'm going to do. So I worked at it, you know, I worked hard, you know, uh, their vision. My goal was to do all I could to see their vision come to pass. Mm -hmm. And I knew what her dream was, she, what her vision was. And for theater, was part of it, mm -hmm. phase one. Phase two was to build a new museum on the property next door, mm -hmm. which she owned. Okay. That was her property. Mm -hmm. And so that was her vision uh, to carry it through. Her vision and their dream was to create or establish a stable institution. So I knew that's what they wanted. Somewhere that's going to be here, that will stay, that will be here in their honor. Mm -hmm. And so uh, their dream has, was not, they were not able to see it, but it is about to happen. And how is that going to take place? This is an exciting story. This is an exciting story. We applied for a grant through the African American historical, African-American cultural historical grant program. Through the state of Florida? Through the state of Florida to build phase two of this museum. Part of her vision was phase two to build a new museum. Mm -hmm, right. We received that grant uh, and we got the grant. We, uh, and we received the notification, the notification in June that we had accepted for the grant. So now in order to make that grant come put into action, there are certain requirements that we must adhere to. Of course. So therefore, that is where we are at this stage right now, is making sure that we're lining all of our ducks up in a row <laughs> so that when it comes time to do what has to be done, executing the contract and all of that ha uh, has to be done, uh, we're ready for that because we know that that's what it's gonna take for us to get from the paper to a building. Right. And so that's where we are working together, the board, uh, chairman, and all, the, all of us. We're working together because we want to see their vision survive right here. Right. So that, is, that was uh, one of my, <clears throat> one of the things that I was hoping that she or both of them would be able to see. But I'm pleased that we, all, we have finally got to that point. And she has a son that lives in Maryland. And he's very, in, he, he is a, he's very concerned. He was very concerned. You know, he, he would bring his mom every year here to visit us. Uh, so he's, he's aware of the, the grant that we received. He's very excited. I'm sure he is. He's yeah. very, very yeah. excited. So, that, so the Johnson family, or Mr. and Mrs. Johnson had moved, I think he was a minister pastor. Yes. Uh, and Mrs. Johnson had moved to Maryland to be closer to their to, son. To their son, Several yes. years ago. But several years ago, because um, Reverend Johnson, you know, he, he, need, he was, they were ready. Actually, they were ready to, mm -hmm. to get closer to their mm -hmm. son. Maybe a few health issues, but whatever it may be, right. they was ready to move closer. And she was ready mm -hmm. to turn over the reins. Mm -hmm. she well, was. she knew she had a competent yeah. uh, executive director yeah. in you, and you had, had and have the passion to keep this place going and to uh, meet her dream of uh, finishing phase two, and then may even be a phase three somewhere yeah. down the line and you know, that will that's be not your funny legacy. Because she does have a, say, a phase three, you know. Oh, she does. I thought you had a phase three, yeah. perhaps. Well this, well, this is the phase two, but see, a phase three would be easier to accomplish because it could be we have this whole big lot, right. you know, there. Uh, our museum would be larger than this museum, of course, and give us more gal gallery space and other, uh, other rooms that, you know, that we you can utilize. But uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's good to know that your legacy, you can leave, that it's good right. to know, it's good to leave a legacy Absolutely. if you can. Mm -hmm. One that, you, that will be beneficial to the entire community, entire Volusia County. It's good to have a legacy follow you. And so this is her legacy that I, I, found, I felt that I, I, I was dedicated to trying to bring it to fruition. 
Before we wrap this uh, interview up, Mary, tell us a little bit about <clears throat> where the museum is located here in Gland mm -hmm. and uh, you know what your hours are, and because I think it's one of um, you know it's a jewel of a museum, mm -hmm. but I think people uh, who see this interview on YouTube, which is mm -hmm. worldwide, mm -hmm. uh, might be attracted to this area just to see this beautiful little museum as it is now, mm -hmm. much less when it becomes mm -hmm. enlarged awesome. with phase mm -hmm. two. So, just give us about a little kids. little bit mm -hmm. of information about dreams. the museum mm -hmm. and what's what people can expect to see when they come here. Okay. Uh, the museum has a changing gallery and it has a permanent gallery. Uh, the changing gallery is open to upcoming artists, young people again, who are starting out as an artist, who might have difficulty getting their foot in the door. She wants to make this place available to young upcoming artists. Mm -hmm. So they have an opportunity to get their, you know, to, to get some notoriety. So her goal was bring them in, let them come in. Mm -hmm. Let them, they can start here. That was one of her goals uh, at that time. And she also wanted to have a place for African American artists to come and showcase their art because there was a the time she felt that their art was not being represented. She had a friend by the name of Miriam Patterson, who was a wonderful artist. And Mrs. Johnson, and she told Mrs. Johnson, ask her, what was her art? She says, my art is under my bed. <laughs> because she says, I have nowhere to exhibit it. So right away, Mrs. Johnson had said, well, we're gonna, we're gonna do something about that. And so that was a vision that Mrs. Johnson came about but making sure that this museum would be a place where artists, upcoming young mm -hmm. artists or upcoming right. artists, will have a place to come and showcase their art. So she did about six art exhibits a year. And she did one for our summer camp kids. They mm -hmm. had an exhibit. She also did an, an exhibit, but non-African American artists. So this museum is also open to non-African American right. artists mm -hmm. as well. But that was her vision to make sure that they had a place to come and a place for others to come to view our art. So we have about six exhibits a year. We also have several uh, different festivals a year, which we have right here on our premises here. We also utilize the amphitheater for our, uh, we do a jazz fest. We do the Kwanzaa, we do other poetry. So she wanted this to be just an overall venue mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for people to come and see our, our art. We have artists from um, all over Central Florida. We just had an artist from Seattle, Washington, many of them from uh, Daytona, New Smyrna Beach. So we have a, a array of different artists come and, and display their artwork and do lectures, uh, artist talks here. Um, so, and many of the artifacts that we have here are donated to the museum. Many of them are donated from world travelers. Mm -hmm. Many of them are authentic pieces. Mm -hmm. We have documentation history on them. Right. Many of them are donated <clears throat> from people from the community who, ha who wanted to donate a piece of art that they had from the families. So we, we utilize that as part of our permanent collection. Mm -hmm. We have a good 500 or more pieces here. Oh, you do, I know yes, that. Yes, and we cannot showcase them all. Mm -hmm. So this exhibit that you see here today will no longer be here. We have an artist, a self-taught Jamaican artist coming up on August 13th. Everything that you see here on the walls will be put up, stored away until we decide to do another permanent collection. This what you see here is our permanent collection. It only comes up maybe once a year oh. or twice a year. Mm -hmm. So this is it. The rest are artists who uh, come in to display their artwork. Everything that you see on the tables here will mm -hmm. remain out for the public, but the artwork will change every six to eight weeks. I see. The art is going to change with the new artists coming in. Well, this is really a jewel of a museum, mm -hmm. and um, you have much to be proud of. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I really appreciate you coming in mm -hmm. and doing this, or letting us come in and mm -hmm. do the interview with you today. <clears throat> and before we wrap this up, Mary, 
Uh, there's a couple of questions we always ask at the uh, Historical Society when we do these um, interviews. And the first one is, um, what advice would you give young people today? Okay. Based on your own experience. The advice that I would give to, to young people today is to say to them, regardless of your background, be proud of who you are, get to know your own history and culture, mm -hmm and contributions from those of your community and for those of the past and for those of the present. And don't be afraid to step out and do, follow your dreams. Step out and follow your dreams. Uh, learn to travel, because to me, I tell young people, travel is one of the best educations you can get. Mm -hmm as you're growing up, as you get older. It's one of the best educations that you can get because it teaches you, it shows you that everyone, every culture has value, has importance. So it kind of opens your, your mind. It does mm -hmm. that regardless of who you are, regardless of your background, you are worthy of your culture, of who you are as being proud of yourself and your contribution to this country. Be proud of that. Let no one turn you around. Stand firm, believe in yourself, and as they say it, go for it. Go for it. Go for it. And I guarantee you if you, if you take the enthusiasm of Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune and look at her accomplishment today, it's still here today. And what she has done, not just for her, for the African-American race, but for the country, for the world as a whole. Don't, be a, don't dare to dream. Don't dare to step out and go for what vision you have. Don't let anyone take it from you. Go for it. Strive for it and make, make it come to, make it true. Make it come to, to be a reality for you. Well, that's excellent advice. And, yes. uh, for young people and older people and older as people, well, yes. of course, yes. you know, we always need yes. to be able to uh, feel good about who we are and what we've done. And so. what you've done and, and share that with others, sure. especially young people yeah. coming up. So, and I can say that um, I don't regret it. I have, it's been, I have enjoyed it tremendously. I'm still open to learning and I'm still in sharing what I know to anyone else I'm willing to share. So it has been a journey for me. Well, um, the last question, and I think you've pretty well covered this mm -hmm. already, is <clears throat> when you look back over your life and your accomplishments, um, what would be the one or two things, if we can narrow it down mm -hmm. that much, that you would like to be remembered for? What would be your legacy? My legacy would be remembered is that I am proud of who I am as an African American. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm proud of my contributions that I have made to other communities, not just the African American community here in Deland, but I'm proud of being able to share my knowledge and my uh, experiences with others. I hope that I am, I can be a word of encouragement mm -hmm. for others who might be considering or trying to debate whether or not should I do this or should I not do it. Well. Follow your heart sometimes. Follow your heart, follow your dreams. So my uh, concept, just remember me as a person who dared to dream, a person who dared to accept a challenge and go for it. When I said yes to Mrs. Johnson, I accepted her challenge to take this museum from where she left it at the time to another place. And I feel that I've done that. So I, I'm, I'm proud of who I am, and I hope everyone feels that I have done my best and a good job following in her footsteps. 